here we are. Um, we will be recording this session. Um, so please take breaks as you need, knowing that you can always return to the recording. And just a note, we'll stop recording during our more interactive session at the end, just for privacy purposes and to make sure people feel comfortable just sharing. Um, and this program will feature real-time closed captioning. So please hit that CC button on your Zoom toolbar to access those. And we have the wonderful Nadia Kim in the chat who will introduce herself in a moment. But if you need anything throughout the session, feel free to uh, just message her. Um, I wanted to include a note on language uh, before we get started. There's language that we'll encounter in looking at Du Bois data visualizations, particularly when Du Bois describes Black Americans, as we see here. And we like to make sure that students know they'll encounter this, um, that you know that you'll encounter this, and that language changes. Um, so we like to make mention of that here as well. A quick agenda. So just to give you a sense of how we'll spend our time today, we'll be doing some introductions and then a poll to get to know all of you. And then we'll move into thinking more deeply at our exhibition, review the resources, and as I said, have some time um, off the recorded Zoom for discussion. Um, so I'm going to let everyone who you'll meet today say hello. So I'm going to kick it over to Nadia, who will introduce herself, and then to Alexa, and then to Christina. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Nadia. I'm the team programs coordinator at Cooper Hewitt. Um, I'm a light-skinned Asian woman with long black hair wearing a beige sweater with a Julie Moretu poster behind me. So I'll be the tech person um, for this session. So if you have any issues regarding like joining breakout rooms or um, questions about the presentation, just feel free to um, ask me in the chat or message me directly. And I'll pass it off to Alexa Griffith. Hi, everyone. Welcome. I am um, Alexa Griffith. My title at Cooper Hewitt is Manager of Content and Curriculum. And I was part of the team that put together um, the field trip experience um, that is um, part of the curriculum that we're going to be working with you all with today. So I'm thrilled to be here. I am um, a middle-aged white um, person with light skin and salt and pepper hair that is um, getting more salty every day. Um, and I am going to pass this off to our colleague, Christina DeLeon. Hi, everyone. I'm Christina DeLeon. I'm the Acting Deputy Director of Curatorial um, at Cooper Hewitt. I'm a curator focused on Latino design. And while I'm not the curator of this exhibition, I did work very closely with the curators um, to see through this show. And so I'm I'm excited to, to share a few images of the exhibition um, and um, some more about how we came together um, on, on the layout. Thank you all so much. And uh, I'm seeing in the chat that we have folks from all over, which is super exciting. We're going to use a tool called Mentimeter to get to know you all uh, fairly quickly. So I'm just going to stop sharing this screen and begin sharing another screen. I don't know if folks are familiar with Mentimeter, but it is a, a data tool. Um, so there's two questions in this uh, Mentimeter. The first one is, what grades do you teach? I have five through 12th year, and I've noticed some folks that are in um, a college setting. That's totally OK. Um, you don't have to vote here. There's another question that says, what comes to mind when you think of the phrase data storytelling? So if you head over to the link that Nadia shared in the chat or go to menti.com and enter the code 37026144, you can answer the questions and we will get to see them populate live here. A little experimental uh, data visualization happening now. I see we've got nine people here. Oh, wow. Okay. This is fun. <laughs> uh, they're coming in. So it's looking like most folks are in those upper grades, but we've got a really nice mix of people from all, um, all grades. I'll give it, keep it open for a little longer. 
10th grade pulling through. All right. I can return to this one, but I have another question for all of you, which is what comes to mind when you think of the phrase data storytelling? And this is menti.com 3702 6144 boring charts. <laughs> Amazing first impressions. <laughs> All right, give us some more. We've got infographics, evidence-based, numbers, charts, history, accessibility. I'd love to hear more about that. Interdisciplinary, color, evidence-based, charts. So we have a beautiful uh, visualization of the, the data that y'all are giving us right now. Um, I love this tool. It's um, I'm using the free version right now just for full transparency. Um, you're allowed to do this. You're allowed to do two slides um, and it's a great classroom tool um, if you've got some kind of um, tool to, or projector in your classroom, students can uh, cast their votes. You can do this um, asynchronously or all together like we're doing now. I'm seeing some really interesting things, expanding understanding, functional, evidence-based, fun, thank you, fun, uh, meaning-making, humanizing, numbers, 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 viewpoint, and these are all things that we'll, we'll talk about. And I also see the word bias, um, which is really interesting and something that we should, we should dig into as well. Um, so thank you all so much for your responses. And I'm going to stop sharing, um, and we're going to dive into the exhibition a little bit, um, but hold all of these thoughts because we're going to return to them when we come back to talk about the um, classroom materials and the, and the curricula. So I'll hand it over to you, Christina. Thanks. I'm just going to start sharing my screen. Okay. Can you see that at full screen? I can. Yes. Great. So welcome everyone to Cooper Hewitt. For those of you who are not familiar with the museum, I think I might just start with just providing a little bit of a background as to um, where we're housed because our building very much influences the way in which we put exhibitions together. And, um, and so I, I, I like to start with that um, because we're in a unique situation. Cooper Hewitt is housed in the former mansion of Andrew Carnegie, who was a steel magnate at one moment in his life was um, the most, uh, the, the wealthiest man in the entire world. Um, and he's known for his philanthropy in particular for libraries. Um, but he definitely had a, a reach that we still feel today in, in many of the institutions throughout the United States and abroad. So we are housed in his former home and um, a lot of historic architecture is still very much in place, particularly in the first and second floors. As you move through the, the building, um, less and less historic architecture is included. Um, the first being the most, the second a little bit less, the third almost nothing, and the fourth floor um, is actually some office spaces which have no historic architecture left. Um, so this exhibition is housed on our second floor. Uh, which actually used to be where a lot of the bedrooms and more private rooms of the family were. Uh, so we're, we're working with a sort of funny um, space in that there's, there's a lot of architecture and design already embedded into the space that we work through. So this is a, a very long and expensive gallery that we have on the second floor. And uh, there's a very large staircase that you go up, and as you land on the second floor, 
you encounter this view, um, which is the start of the exhibition with the title Deconstructing Power, W.E.B. Du Bois at the 1900 World's Fair. And the premise of the show is thinking about Du Bois's participation in the 1900 World's Fair, but situating that within a larger context of, of what is a World's Fair, which um, during this time, World's Fairs were really a moment for countries throughout the world to really show their progress, um, whether that be in technology, in art, um, in uh, machinery, in the food that was grown. I mean, really all aspects of life um, were represented in world's fairs. But um, uh, previous world's fairs um, had excluded the participation of African-Americans um, uh, represented in, from the United States. And so there had been a movement to have representation at the 1900 World's Fair, of which, you know, at the very last minute, um, they were able to receive um, support, financial support from the U.S. government to have an exhibition and display that was spearheaded by W.E.B. Du Bois, who was at the time um, a well-known sociologist, um, and he was he was born in Great Barrington, Massachusetts. He had studied at Fisk University, and also was the first um, uh, Black American to to graduate from Harvard University. He had studied abroad in Germany. Um, he was a very learned man, um, but also a very worldly one because of his travels. And he was essentially asked to put together um, an installation with the support of his students um, at the time he was working at Atlanta University. And so this is an interesting project because it was one that although we, we really put forth Du Bois's name. It was definitely a collective um, uh, project that was done with his students and also um, the librarian from the Library of Congress at the time who was the first African-American librarian um, there named Daniel P. Murray. Um, and so it's interesting with all of this background context to think about his installation within a much um, broader uh, exhibition like the World's Fair, which was really meant to bring the best of the best on view and show that your country was um, the most progressive in terms of technology, innovation, aesthetics, um, you know, everything you could think of about. Um, but here in this installation, we're really focusing on the decorative arts and thinking the way, thinking through the way in which the objects that are on view, many of which were either included in World's Fairs, um, including the 1900 World's Fair, or an example of which was included in the, the fair, gives you a sense of the type of ways in which countries like to put forth a very particular type of image um, and really um, uh, as a way of, of covering up some of the more um, difficult, challenging, biased, um, social, political, racial injustices that were happening in their countries, um, colonialism, so on and so forth. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that more as we walk through the show. Um, walk through virtually. <laughs> uh, but this just gives you a sense of um, what what is the premise of, of this exhibition. So as I was mentioning, um, Du Bois put together this, this installation. It was called The Exhibit of American Negroes. And it had a number of, of components. It had 60 data visualizations of which at Cooper Hewitt, we have 25 on view. Um, after the World's Fair, these um, data visualizations went on a, a small tour, but then were almost immediately um, collected 
by the Library of Congress, um, and they really haven't been shown um, to the public in over 100 years. So this is a, a, a pretty big feat for us at Cooper Hewitt to be able to show them for the first time in, in so long. They were really meant to be almost ephemeral. They're made on very um, thin paper, and um, and because students were working on them and they were hurried and they, you know, made um, trips across the Atlantic <laughs> twice, um, you know, they, they're in very delicate uh, state. So that's why they haven't been shown in, in so long, but they underwent some conservation treatment and um, we're happy to have them on view. But you can see this sort of dynamic installation that Du Bois put together, which included patents by African-American engineers and inventors. It included agricultural tools, um, photographs. It also included um, almost a thousand periodicals, books, all types of literature, that was um, written by African-Americans at the time. So the premise of this installation was to show the progress of African-Americans in the United States and, and how that progress came to be without the support of the US government. So the point Du Bois was trying to, to make was um, in spite of all of the um, challenges and roadblocks, um, both social, political, um, governmental laws that came into place after uh, Reconstruction, um, that African American communities across the United States were were still working um, to, you know, uh, gain more education, um, have their own businesses, uh, and we'll talk a little bit about the types of data that he put forth. Above all, Du Bois was very much a champion of equality. He thought it was of the utmost importance that African-Americans be thought of as equal to their white counterparts. And um, through these data visualizations, Du Bois was trying to make the, the point that, you know, African-Americans um, were just as educated, um, just as well read, you know, were able to take um, advantage of, of job opportunities by, by making their own businesses or getting into certain fields like education um, and that this progress was um, needed to be well known and needed to be, have a, a global um, presence. And so, he, oh, and then this is just a, a photograph of Du Bois. This was his um, ID card for the, for the fair that we also had on view. So as um, we go through the exhibition, we have this introduction of the data visualization, um, this blow up of the installation, and then the first retreating that you see here are some of the decorative arts um, objects that would have been on display. Um, so that big vase that's there in the, in the middle, that's a vase that was um, made by Tiffany & Co, um, which is a name that like many of us are, are probably very familiar with. Um, but other companies like Gorham, um, which was a very famous silver company, these were all um, uh, companies that would bring their most beautiful, their most innovative objects to be on view. They were also among their most expensive. Um, so these companies were known to bring um, objects that were really showstoppers that then they would sell at like premium, premium price. So, um, this view shows the way in which we're mixing in the data visualizations with some of these, these objects, as, as I mentioned. And the data visualizations are grouped into um, different themes like um, nation building, um, education, mobility, 
um, just statistics about population growth across the United States um, of African Americans. And we have different groupings. I think what's very interesting about these data visualizations in particular, um, and when I saw some of the, the, the responses that you all had about what do you think about in data visualizations, um, you know, it's like, it's charts, right? <laughs> it's, it's this wall here in many ways. And I actually, I think this grouping is kind of funny because it's, it's probably the most, um, the most obvious idea when you think about like a data visualization or, or some type of chart is like bars, colors, um, but actually Du Bois employed all types of, um, of, of graphic uh, treatments to think through data in a way that would be compelling and interesting and dynamic. And I think much of the success of these data visualizations is the fact that he is thinking through innovative ways to communicate um, facts that are are sometimes very difficult for the public to understand or digest, or perhaps people might have a lot of bias or prejudice against. And so thinking through how to provide a very large and broad public, um, particularly in Europe, um, a better understanding of the, the living conditions uh, of African Americans in the United States was something that he was very attuned to, um, even in the language that he used. Um, many of the data visualizations are actually bilingual. They're both in English and in French. French at the time was sort of the lingua franca for uh, many Europeans. So it, it would have been a language that um, even if you weren't French, you may have been able to read through. Some more images. And then this is, uh, we have a, a small room off of this larger gallery space. We refer to this room as the teak room and the show continues um, in here. This is a very special room um, within actually the entire house because while Carnegie was the richest man in the world and while this mansion, um, you walk in and it, feels very grand and outlandish. <laughs> um, for his time, it was actually very conservative and very subdued with the exception of this room, um, which was designed by an artist named Lockwood DeForest, who was very much captivated and, um, and honestly like a bit obsessed with India. And so all of the decorative elements, the wood, the carving, the patterns, it's all um, inspired by Indian architecture and craftsmanship. Um, and it's actually the only, one of the few rooms that we have that um, is, is really fully complete. Um, definitely the only room on the second floor where you have um, you know, the ceiling, the woodwork, the furniture, um, the wallpaper, it's its all intact. And, and this was meant, you know, as a sort of fantastical um, room in the house. It was originally the family library. Um, it was a place where the family came together to read, to rest, um, to, to spend time, to spend quality time together. Um, but it's but it's a room that's meant to provide this sort of exotic flair within a very conservative type room. So in this space, we used it as um, as a gallery space to talk about a section um, that we call imperial fantasies, which is that many of the objects that were included in these types of world's fairs were sort of these, you know, grand, um, uh, objects that were a mishmash of a lot of different cultures kind of like blended together. Um, and also that this is a, a part of the exhibition where we talk about the type of 
pavilions that were also included in the World's Fair, which included, you know, an entire section of of colonized um, regions throughout the world, particularly um, colonized uh, countries in Africa. And the types of um, uh, fantasy architecture that was built in these world's fairs um, in the 1900 uh, iteration was no different. They would create these villages, um, which were not, um, were, were not uh, um, designed to be a one-to-one -one replica, but really like a made up fantasy of what a, a village um, uh, in India or a village of the Dahomey people um, in Africa would look like. And they would also even bring in people from those regions to also, um, work these pavilions. Sometimes they would serve food, sometimes they would play music, um, but this was all a constructed fantasy idea that was communicated as truth to the public. Because for, for much of the public, they had no idea what these um, countries and villages and regions um, look like, and the World's Fair was a way to experience them, um, but it it wasn't actually uh, the, the truth. And so we talk about that story, and we have a whole um, case that's included with some photographs and some archival materials, but then we also have um, furniture like this cabinet that's um, in the middle that was designed by Carlo Bugatti of the Bugatti car family. Um, and he was very fascinated by um, Japan and North Africa. And much of his furniture is a mashup of, of those two cultures and their aesthetics. And, and the furniture is like super weird, <laughs> if I'm being perfectly honest. Um, but it was again, like um, really leaning into this, um, this interest in, in taking um, the, the art, the aesthetics from other countries and sort of remixing that in a way that was um, through, through a very much European lens. And here are just some, some more pieces. So I'm just finishing up with a few of the data visualizations because I think the way in which Du Bois um, uh, designed each one and was, was really actually ingenious. Um, in some cases, he's using a pie chart, um, as, as you see here on the right. Um, and in some cases, there's a lot of text and he wants to make sure that that text is in both languages so that the public really understands what they're looking at. And so it's interesting to think through the different types of design solutions and design thinking. He, he uses you know, different colors for each language, um, color blocks. Um, this uh, data visualization to the left is actually one of my favorites because it's it's using it's it's talking about um, uh, Black American businessmen and the types of businesses um, they own um, or the types of um, jobs they have, um, and using very simple um, uh, shapes like squares and rectangles, you know, visually, you really are able to understand very, very quickly um, the type of information that he's trying to, to put forth. Um, again, some more uh, visualizations that talk about um, the proportion of free men and slaves in the United States. Um, this uh, data visualization on the right, I think is very interesting, which um, looks at the population of African-Americans in the United States versus the populations of countries um, like Hungary, 
Australia, Spain. Um, this data visualization on the left, the city and rural population is also one of my absolute favorites. Um, and I think this is a good example of, of the way in which he was trying to capture people's attention um, through that spiral. Also, I hope you got a sense through these image, through the installation images that I showed that these data visualizations are, are very big. They're very striking. Um, and even though these are high res um, images, and I think you get a good sense of, of the color, when you're faced with them in person, it's just like so palpable, the, um, the hand, right? That like you really feel someone made this. Um, and also the care in trying to um, communicate all types of information in this, you know, one rectangular um, piece of paper. I think I, here we go. Um, again, uh, a few other examples um, that have to do with occupation of African Americans versus whites in Georgia. While many of the data visualizations were looking at data across the United States, he did use Georgia as a case study. So um, many of the data visualizations really focus on Georgia in particular, which had a very large um, population of African Americans um, and provided, you know, a, a, a good example of the, the Black American experience in the United States at that time. Um, again, some, some other options. Um, one about teachers <laughs> and and the population of of teachers, uh, African American teachers, and how um, the number of teachers um, had risen um, from 1886 to 1897, and that's it. Thank you so much, Christina. Um, now that we have a really wonderful kind of primer for um the exhibition uh I was curious to do do folks have any questions there were a few really good ones that popped up in the chat that we sort of tried to answer as we went but um do folks have questions before we dive into sort of some of the curricular applications of some of this work before Christina heads out so we have a question uh Christina about what medium was used to apply the color Oh, so it was um, mostly gouache, watercolor, um, some some pen and ink in some cases for some of the more um, delicate text writing. Amazing. Can't believe that they got such precision with all of that. Um, and Robert's asking, what will happen after the exhibition is over at Cooper Hewitt? Will it go back to Library of Congress or travel? It is going back to the Library of Congress. Um, so if you are in New York, I would say, or in the tri-state area, please come and see them um, because this is sort of a very unique um, opportunity to see them in person. However, the Library of Congress has digitized all of the data visualizations. And so if you're interested in looking through all 60 of them, 60 plus of them, um, you should go to the Library of Congress. I actually love to do a plug for the Library of Congress because they have an excellent website with um, really incredible high, high resolution images um, that are free. So um, if you want to see more of these data visualizations, I encourage you to, to go to the website and, and check them out. Amazing. And then the last question, um, and uh, Minton, I see your question about uh, dates and hours, which we'll um, respond to in the chat, but Karina just wanted to know, how did uh, Du Bois collect the data? Oh, good question. Um, so. As you might see, some of the data, um, well, most of the data doesn't really go up to 1900. Uh, it goes, you know, up to like 1898, around there. 
And that was because um, that was the data that he was, that was the most recent data he was able to um, gather that was, that was um, a data that was confirmed and that had, had been, um, uh, yeah, that he, that he knew was um, viable data that he could share out. Um, he, he did have issues um, at times, like being able to get the type of data that he wanted. Sometimes that posed like great difficulty for him. Um, and so sometimes he, he was a few years behind where he wanted to be in terms of assessing data on, on certain um, issues regarding um, uh, the African-American community. Uh, but this, because he was working it's such a short period of time to put this together. It it is a little late, or not late, but some of the data is a little bit older. And it was not based on census data, or it was based on census yeah, data. Yes, so some of it is based on census data, and some of it is based on his own data collecting as well. Hmm. Thank you so much again, Christina. Um, that was wonderful and super informative. And uh, we will dive right into some of the connections now that we can start to make together um, as educators. So I'm gonna share my screen one more time um, and hand it over to Alexa because um, she's going to tell us a little bit more just sort of about why data and design and, and um, its use and its power. Thank you. And thank you so much, Christina. Um, we, I, as I mentioned in the beginning, was part of the team that developed the curriculum for the field trip um, this year, this school year at Cooper Hewitt. And we had um, an amazing opportunity to, first of all, um, welcome students back into our galleries in person for the first time in a long time in almost two years. Um, and we also had this incredible learning opportunity of having the Du Bois data visualizations or data portraits as he called them, in our galleries and we wanted to take every um, opportunity that we could to create um, opportunities for engagement um, with our New York City school population um, with these um, incredible data portraits. And um, we believed that data collecting, data analysis and data visualization was something that um, young people today, school kids today are extremely well equipped to do. And so we wanted to create um, informal teaching opportunities. And what I mean by that is we wanted to create some tracks that were age appropriate for middle school and high school students to engage with the data portraits, the data visualizations. Um, but we didn't, as informal educators necessarily wanted to, we wanted to create a flexible platform or scaffolding that you all as subject matter experts can take into the classroom and apply to social studies or to statistics or design or art or whatever it is. But we are um, in this example, not pegging it to any specific uh, course standards, excuse me. Um, we have however provided national course standard um, alignment for the field trip um, experience. We know that some of you, many of you are joining from out of New York State. We thought this would be a national audience. And so we did want to um, use the national course standards as a benchmark, but um, understanding of course that every state has its own um, standards and uh, procedures. So we were really excited to um, harness the power of image, of information, um, to take Du Bois example of creating um, uh, information with a kind of a deep rhetorical power um, that is speaking truth to power in the context of this World's Fair. And, um, and we have um, really had so much fun with um, seeing what some of our students come up with over the course of the year. And we have heard um, from teachers who teach statistics, who teach art, who teach social studies, um, that they're coming specifically for this curriculum. So we do believe it's something that is um, a really valuable tool that can be, um, that can serve your teaching needs in a, in a really um, remarkable variety of ways. So um, one thing that we had to do really quickly was break down what is data? Um, what is the collecting of data? And what is the kind of um, uh, categorization of data? And then what does it mean to present it visually? 
And my colleague, Tiffany Lukey, um, who was my partner in creating this curriculum, found this wonderful image of Legos. And it really kind of snapped for us when we saw this and we thought we absolutely can create um, an accessible and engaging curriculum around data storytelling. Um, once we saw this, we understood that we can make that clear to young people as well. So this was a really foundational image for us and one that we share with students as well. And I'm curious in the chat uh, what folks' impressions are in terms of that second question. Um, what skills do you think are really needed to move from this data unsorted Lego to the last uh, the last item, which is it's you know data vi uh, visually presented? We'll give folks a minute to answer in the chat. Nadia, if you see any coming through, you can feel free to read them. All right, so it looks like we've got the more technical and practical skills needed, like an artistic eye and hand, but conceptually understanding relationships between the data and analyzing them. Absolutely. And I think we're starting to see some students doing that here, right, Alexa? Yeah. And so this is um, a wonderful image that my colleague found of a young student who was a very enthusiastic collector of scrunchies. She wanted to um, document her collection. And by doing that, she also counted the number of scrunchies and created this incredible bar graph showing how many scrunchies she had by color. So you see she has a lot of pink, a lot of purple and gray and lesser numbers of the other colors. Um, then this information was also um, put into um, an Excel spreadsheet to turn into a pie chart. But it's just showing that kids are already enthusiastic collectors and critical analysis um, analysts of information. And they, this kind of um, visualization is um, something that they are very capable of doing with a lot of creativity. Yeah, they're good at it. Um, and we pulled this example out for that same reason. Uh, it's a very relatable example. So on the screen is a chart with a number of musical artists and a line of different emoji next to them. So this is data from Spotify, which also has data sets, which if you're interested, uh, we'll put some of that in the chat. And uh, the most common emojis that people used when making playlists that featured different artists. So we share that example, because like Alexa said, we've noticed some students are really practiced and really tapped into the visual component of data storytelling, likely because of the prevalence of like emoji and memes and things like class dojo. Um, so we're gonna paste that resource in the chat if, in case everyone feels like exploring, but uh, Tableau has a lot of really nice uh, student-friendly data resources. Um, just a heads up to everything we put in the chat, we'll uh, give you in a post-program email so you don't have to go um, too wild saving the chat. In terms of another example, um, on the screen here are two data visualizations by the artist and data journalist Mona Chalabi. And on the left, we have a hand that appears to be drowning, measuring rising global uh, sea levels over time. And on the right, a bar graph made of fists that showcases the number of years different countries have had with female heads of state. So these are good examples of uh, what we're calling data storytelling, because to me, while it doesn't give uh, us every single detail, it uses data to evoke an emotional response. Um, and I think Mona rehumanizes data to sort of better help us understand our world and the way that we live in it, right? We often have associations, as we saw in the beginning, boring charts uh, in our word cloud. Uh, so these associations with data, and I have them as well, as something cold or unrelated to human life, but like, in fact, it offers so much about speaking about our human condition. And Du Bois was at the forefront of this. And so are artists like uh, Mona. Uh, similarly, this is the climate crisis font by type designers, Eno Korkala and Daniel Cole for a Finnish newspaper. And it's this variable typeface that shows us this very dynamic visualization of the effects of climate change on Arctic sea ice. So the, the font maps uh, the like shrinking expansions of ice onto the weight of the typeface. So we see like the bold letters in 1979 
And then these words kind of melt into illegibility, essentially, uh, by the 2050 projection. And it just makes this passage of time and collective action or potentially inaction, like very noticeable regarding climate change. So this is a font, but it's, it is giving us information in a really evocative way. And I'm seeing Alexa right in the chat. We wanted to show that data storytelling can be both quantitative and qualitative. Agree. That's one very good example of that. Um, all right, so this one is around data evoking, evoking emotions like the examples in the last two slides, um, but it can also be personal. So we collect data on our own lives. This is an image of a series of small paint dabs on a piece of paper with some ink marks around them. So it's part of a project called Dear Data by data designers Georgia Lupi and Stephanie Posevec, who sent letters to one another in the form of data postcards. And we can see the key here on the back of the postcard. Uh, the paint dabs are mapping these different smells that Georgia Lupi encountered throughout the course of the week. And like the little pen marks indicate the duration that she experienced the smell. Um, so we can see she smelled everything from like beauty products to coffee to trash. Um, I think she's a New Yorker, so trash definitely makes makes its way in there. Um, and I love this example because part of understanding data storytelling is just like feeling that sense of agency. And students can very much easily collect data on their own lives. Like I, I used to teach K-5 art and I would hear kids in the like lunchroom be like, raise your hand if you like fruit punch. Like they're already doing it. It's very much part of their life. Um, and I had a student recently who visualized her like different years of her life as the weather app on her phone. And I just like learned so much about her that day. So it can become very personal. Um, before we dive into the classroom resource, I just wanted to quickly bring us back to Du Bois. Um, as Christina shared with us, when Du Bois showed his work at the World's Fair, people not, had not seen data visualized like this in the year 1900. And he still remains like ahead of the curve. Um, but I also wanted to get into why. So like Du Bois and his Atlanta University students, they made 63 hand-drawn diagrams. They used shape, they used line, color, all to showcase the success of Black Americans and everything they had achieved despite racism in the United States and in the bigger global community. So he also included images of you know, text, but the visualizations, as you can see here, provide really clear evidence and like you cannot argue with data. Um, so his legacy lives today. Um, and you know, as we mentioned, data can shape our lives. It can be a tool for oppression, a tool for empowerment. And Mona Chalabi, whose work we looked at earlier with the, um, with the hands, um, retraced Du Bois' efforts in 2017. So we can see her version on the right where she collected, she did use census data um, and is showing us how wealth varies by race in America today. So you can see there's um, actually not a lot of progress. It is like a, a pretty bleak uh, look at it, but it is very interesting to see them side by side. And I think that's important. So that's bringing us to our classroom research uh, resource. So we're gonna put the PDF of the resource in the chat uh, and in a post-program email. So don't worry, you'll get all of this in your inbox as well as the recording. But we wanted to spend a bit of time on the content itself of the curricula or lesson plan that we put forth. Um, the resource contains two tracks, one for fifth through eighth grade, and one for ninth through 12th grade. Uh, depending on your setting, you can kind of mix and match. I'm sure there's other things that you'll add and subtract and we very much welcome that. But the resource for the younger grades is called Data, Design, and Me. And the focus is on translating data into imagery. That's my cat. That can help students better understand themselves and their communities. Whereas in nine through 12, we call that track Data Visualization for Change. So that in those grades, we focus on how data visualization has become a very powerful tool for like analyzing inequity, just as Du Bois uh, was doing. Um, and each track, as you can see here, um, includes key vocabulary, a conversation guide, and a hands-on activity. So we will dive into all of that now. Um, here we've got some sample vocabulary. 
We've defined these words in the resource. Some of it overlaps. Nine through 12 has more of a focus on analysis and evaluating data, whereas fifth through eighth focuses on like, what is a survey? What is data visualization? Um, one important and kind of funny thing our educators in our field trip program shared out is that students associate the word data with their cell phone plans, like they're out of data. Um, so they must stop scrolling videos on their on their phone. So um, we wanted to get ahead of that and talk about data in a, in a different way. And that's usually where folks tend to start. Uh, we also have a conversation guide. Uh, you can really see the difference between the two tracks here. And depending on your setting, you might borrow from the other column. This is truly just a suggestion. But uh, in fifth through eighth, we see a focus on what data is, how we where it's where we see it in our lives, and just starting to notice it. Where again in ninth through twelfth, we really start to think about data as a tool for change. What is progress? Um, and you can even use that context of the World's Fair here. Um, we saw a lot of evidence in the World's Fair of what different countries thought progress was. Um, but I like to ask students what they think progress really means. And sometimes they'll go right to like, oh, it's a it's a Tesla. But then they'll say, no, no, wait, it's um, it's changing the way that we treat each other. Um, so it, it really gets into an interesting conversation. So we will um, dive into the activity quickly, and then we'll save the last 15 minutes or so for an open discussion. Um, this is our activity warm up, uh, which just gives you an idea of our activity warm up. Um, this can be done with post-its of any color. Uh, we like to gather students together and put a pile of post-its in the center. And you can include a key here, very simply, like yellow could mean no, green could mean yes. And we ask a question. You can ask a question that ties into their day. You could do a get to know you. You could do something with social emotional. How is everyone feeling? High school students, I like to ask what their cafe order is. Is it like coffee, tea, boba, water? Um, and you can build in that question. You can build in a question that pertains to your curriculum too. Um, and in any case, just ask students to vote with their post-its and just put them on a board, on the floor, on a large table, uh, whatever you have access to. And then we get that pile of information, just like the Lego bricks we saw earlier, and we ask students to organize the information. And invariably, they create a data visualization here. It's like almost automatic. And likely they make a bar graph. Um, I most, most, most students start to use like math manipulatives in the early grades. So they're just like super savvy on putting all this information together and can likely just do it together, depending on the size of your group. Um, and then you can compare. You can just take a step back and say, what did we just do with this information? Uh, how does it impact our understanding of the class? Um, so you can really dive into the activity itself from here. So I'll turn it over to Alexa to share more about that. So these are just the two peer collection, peer data collecting sheets that we developed for the, um, the field trip tracks. And these can be, you will get these um, with your information um, following this, um, this PD, but they're very um, customizable. So you can easily take these into the classroom and create your own data sets that, that you want students to collect. But we wanted them to engage with each other. We didn't want to have just like a one way we are talking to the students, we wanted to have them speaking to each other talking to us about the data that they're collecting. Um, to really show that it's dynamic and it can be really fun and again, it is a really accessible thing to do so with the. Um, um, the the younger the middle school students it's really more about thinking about your community and so they're asking their peers um, things like what kind of pet do you have a pet and what kind of pet. Um, what types of snacks are your favorites, learning about their friends, um, what is your mood today? Again, uh, just a way to check in and to, um, you know, to use data as, um, as a point of engagement. For the older students, as Kirsten said, we're, they, they tend to be very much engaged in current events. They're really concerned about the climate crisis. They're really concerned about racial justice, gender justice, all these um, important things that, um, that are very much a part of the news and the, and the day to day at the moment. So we wanted to help them feel empowered through data to think about what are the issues that they are most committed to um, changing for the better and how will they do it? So um, is it climate justice, racial justice, gender justice? Again, these are very customizable. Um, and then how are you going to do it? Are you gonna do it by calling? Are you gonna do it through a protest? Are you gonna do it by raising funds and donating? 
Um, and then how do you want to enact this change? Are you going to start to work locally, nationally, or globally? So again, just with this short, this very um, simple matrix, you can ask them to really think about um, serious issues that they're interested in and to, to imagine um, how they can take agency and how they can enact change. Um, so um, this also is a way to kind of keep them um, engaged throughout the, the tour of the exhibitions, which is another important thing for us to keep their bodies moving, their minds moving. It's a really good pedagogical tool. And I would say too, if you, uh, we'll send you these, if you want to use them and like as a activity, students can walk around and collect the data right in your classroom, or you can assign it as homework, or if your students are ready for it, they can develop their own questions for their data sets and do them out in the world. And we've got some student examples, right? And we've been, yeah, just blown away by the creativity of the visualizations that some of the students have done. So this is for the younger students and they're looking at, you know, just kind of taking a snapshot of their, their peer group through data. And so one of them is looking at all three categories, like what kind of pets, and you can see that he's contained all the information in a glass of water, which is ingenious. Um, and then each little line is indicating how many of their, um, their classmates have dogs versus nothing versus cats. Um, and then if you look at the mood, I love this one, they're tired most of all. It gives them a chance to be really frank, which we also love. Um, and then um, happily, no one was mad. Um, the one on the right is is a little bit more um, a, like the, the wonderful Georgia Loopy um, Dear Data visualizations, which this really whimsical kind of candy um, that is indicating the sour, the sweet, or the salty. So um, I think these are incredible examples. Um, showing that you know the students are really engaging immediately and then for the older group um you know they they have really taken to this and they have come up with some really rhetorically very powerful data visualizations sometimes they're a little bit more portraits or like there's more narrative information in them and we think that that is really exciting so we have um, on the on the left, somebody um, is really committed to gender justice, and there's um, a lot of information here too to like, you know, stop stereotyping. Um, not only women clean and work. So within the the visualization that this person has done, they have also kind of made um, a call for action to stop um, the kind of stereotyping that can cause um, imbalance in in between genders. Um, and then this wonderful one on the right is using the form of a plant. Um, and, and leaves to actually visualize the data in terms of her peers, like how do they how do they want to enact change um, in in their world? And each of these, we have activism, um, racial justice, and gender justice, each um, represented by a leaf. So again, we found these really moving and really really um, very powerful uses of data. And then this one is another um, style of data visualization, which is a little um, more abstract, which we think is also really powerful. And um, again, so there are many different, so students can bring their own creative um, vision to these visualizations as well, which I think helps them feel really engaged um, and have agency over the project, which we love. And it's, yeah, um, it's been a really powerful um, activity. We've got some examples from our national high school design competition as well, and these are, um, you know, students have had a little more time to to work on on this. Um, and you can see we'll we'll paste more information about the competition here. But we've got uh, a tenth and eleventh grader who were, you know, thinking about the um, emotional data of a uh, a veteran who is paralyzed, experiencing uh, airline travel to a tool that would help folks uh, learn about uh, native plants and how they um, may, how climate might affect them in Miami. And another tool for thinking about representation in art museums. Um, so really wonderful and beautiful examples there as well. And the high school, yeah, and the high school competition is another example of how um, our department has been really influenced and inspired by the Du Bois exhibition in particular, again, to kind of activate um, young people through the critical use of data storytelling. Oh, the data wall. Yeah, and then just briefly, um, to make 
students really um, clear that we really care about their experience at Cooper Hewitt. If we're asking them to collect information from their peers, we need to collect information from them as well. On um, So we understand um, a few things, where they're coming from, how old they are, and what they thought about their experience at Cooper Hewitt. So the incredible team of Georgia Lupi at Pentagram Design um, created this wonderful data wall for us, which is installed in the ground floor of the museum. If you come to Cooper Hewitt, you can go down and see it. Um, and they created this matrix and a key there for students to identify. It's probably, it's maybe hard to read here, but they are identifying all of our school trips are, are from New York City. So they're coming from the five boroughs and they can identify their age. And then they have um, a colored piece of raffia to let us know what their experience was like. Was it exciting? Were they feeling curious? Were they stressed? Were they anxious? So they, um, so it gives us information as well. Um, at a snapshot of where our students are coming from, roughly how old they are, and um, telling us about their experience. So um, this has also been really thrilling to see the students engage with us. Um, our visitors have been really interested to see it. Our security guards are really encouraging of this project, which tells me, you know, they are watching these students all the time, um, every week go through. And so if they're enthusiastic about it, then I think that, you know, we took that as a really good sign that it was doing something right. Um, but it was really important for us to engage our students in that feedback loop so that we learn something important as well. And then this is just after um, a few weeks. Um, it's really filling up. So you can see by the end of the school year, we'll have a lot more information, but we're already getting some really interesting data from this wonderful data wall in our galleries. I always thought like from from a teaching perspective that this had big bulletin board potential, set it up, watch it grow. Um, so I feel like this could be easily replicated if you've got space. So we wanted to pull back a little bit with the time that we have left. Um, and thank you so much, Alexa, Nadia, and also everybody who's contributed so far in the chat, um, some really wonderful ideas and thoughtful questions. But we, we wanted to, to open this up a little bit um, because as educators, I know that there are very specific ways that you might incorporate this. And we thought we'd just spend a little bit of time um, thinking about how you might use data visualization in the classroom or any of the materials that we've just provided, as well as like what you would add or adjust because um, one size does often not fit all in, in a classroom environment. So. Um, I'm going to stop recording so that we have a little bit more flexibility here. <laughs>